I'm a pilot. Let me tell you something. Ooh. It wouldn't take me oh, no more boy. than two and a half hours to fly down there no. and slap your no. face all over that no, damn studio. Don't. You no. understand it? To Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast, Monty Nafaro, only filmed here out of Indie Music TV. We want to thank everybody for joining us. We are humbled as we're going into a fantastic long weekend, but we're starting off with one of your favorites. Yeah. Big Ron Shaw. Ron, how are you, buddy? Hey, guys. Yes, thank you very much for inviting me to the show. Uh, but you know something? Right out of the gate, I have to say something here. You know... I've been aware of your guys, you guys, your show, and it happens to be the most controversial wrestling show, and if not the only controversial wrestling show that, that I have viewed. And I did see your show last week. And you know mm -hmm. something, Monty? I, mm -hmm. I needed to call you. And you know, you guys did call me to come on your show. But you know something? When we were talking, I needed to lay down some ground rules. And, uh, you know, some of the questions that you said that you were going to ask me on this show tonight, it just wasn't appropriate to me. I didn't want to do it. But you were insisting on it, and I'll tell you something. I had to hang up on you. Now, your listeners ought to know one thing. Why did you lie? I hung up on you. Are you afraid to admit that? Now, when I hung up on you three days later, the Pharaoh gives me a call, and he says, Big Ron, we want you on the show. We worked everything out. We want you on the show. And I called you up, and I said, okay. I'll, ha I'll be happy to do the show. But you know, another thing, Monty, one thing you said, well, I don't care to have Ron Shaw on the show. You know, he's been on other wrestling shows. I don't care. You know, I won't chase him down or nothing like that. Let me tell you something right now. In front of you, I am the only person, past, present, and future, who's got the most upsets in professional wrestling. Let me repeat myself. I've got the most upsets in professional wrestling. And that's something that the WWE has put me in. Their, 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 their big sports books of entertainment, their history books of the Big 50. I'm in the history books of professional wrestling because of that. Okay? So, Ron, I'm going to respectfully... Hey, hey, shut up. I'm not done talking yet. Whoa. Just what shut up. Are you kidding me right now? Easy, bro. Yo, Ron, oh, wait, 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 hold on, on, Ron. I had to go through to get on your show, Monty. You shut up and you just listen to me. <laughs> I never had to go through stuff like this before on one of other shows. I've been on 15 shows in the last seven years, and these five, five wrestling shows, yours is the one that gave me the most problems. I want to be asked decent questions throughout this whole entire show. Has he seen our show? Well, dude, uh, listen, Ron, okay, I'm going to say this again. Understand that I don't think I lied to you, and you're gonna, if you're going to do our show, and I'm saying this respectfully, I'm going to ask questions, we're going to ask questions, and you're going to have to you'll either answer them or don't answer them. I'm okay with that. Look, I, I, don't want, I don't want any issues, dude. We try to respect guys your level, but understand something, that this is my show. Okay? This is our show. And our show. Our but show. if you're going to, you know, if you're going to, Look, dude, here's the deal. Yeah, you're right. I really, look, with all due respect, you're, you're, you're a legend in the business. I get it, whatever else. But, again, I'm not going to retread all the garbage that's been out there already, right? We've heard the story already. And, uh, look, dude, show me the respect I'm trying to show you. That's all I'm trying that's, to say to you. That's fair. Is that fair? That's fair. I gave you the respect. I, you know, I gave you the respect when I called you and I talked to you and I said, let's, let's, let's do this show a sophisticated way, no trash talk, nothing like this. Let's not talk about other issues I've talked on 15, 14 other shows because there's other issues to talk about with Big Ron Shaw. Well, go ahead, buddy. This is your guy. Uh, this, is, this is the guy you wanted on the show, yeah. so how about it? Well, 
So, Ron, I'll tell you what. I'll sit back and I'll let the Pharaoh interview you since you can't seem to handle I don't think the questions I got. I don't have. think that's necessary. I've got, I've got no problem with that. The Pharaoh seems like he's a decent guy. Decent, okay. level-headed guy. We talked on Ron- the phone, man, and, and, I, I, and I have to totally respect the Pharaoh. Well, Ron, I thank you for that. But, wow. Uh, look, uh, right? I, I don't want to get off to a bad start. I, I really don't. The listeners don't want to hear us arguing. They want to hear informative wrestling news and, 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 and what happens in the past and so forth. So let's, let's get on with the interview. Ron, did it ever bother you that you never got further on the card? You were clearly bigger <laughs> than some of the people you were putting over. Uh, did that ever get in the way of your uh, professionalism towards what you were asked to do with the company? Well, I, here's what you had to understand is when I was leaving Kowalski's school, there was another week left of my training. And I asked Kowalski, I said, I said, Walter, I said, how am I doing? He said, you're doing great, Ron. I said, well, good. I said, I'm leaving after next week. My 16 weeks is up. I'd like to go to work for the WWF. Now, I could have said anything else. I'd like to go here, I'd like to go there. But I knew where the money was. And when I started out, you know, they, they, they took me in pretty much, two months after I started getting bookings already. And you have to understand what professional wrestling is. It's like any other job. You're hired for a position, and it's up to you to show your bosses that you want to move up in the company. And I did. And I did, what I did was very well done. That's why I was used all the time. I mean, I just didn't work for the WWE. You know, I did international wrestling for two years. Then in 86 was one of my busiest years. I was still working for WWE, but I went up to... Montreal, Canada, to work for, G- for uh, uh, Dino Bravo, and Rick Martel was even up there. And then I was working for Crockett Promotions a little bit here and there. And that was one of my toughest years of traveling and trying to make all the, all the commitments that I had. But they knew Ron Shaw was a top worker in the business, and if that was my job to make people look good, no matter what size, that's what I did. Ron, you were around during the time that Eddie Mansfield was around. Um, any thoughts on when he had the balls to expose the business? And it was way before the infamous curtain call with the click at the uh, garden. Any uh, thoughts on having the lid ripped off of, uh, you know, the sport we all love? Well, you know, the Pharaoh man, that's a great question. You know, the 14 shows that I've been on, nobody's ever asked me that question. Hmm. And, uh, you know, what I thought about it at the time is uh, there was a uh, great reporter in Philadelphia from the Philadelphia Inquirer uh, newspaper, and they asked me, hey, they're doing a story here on this guy, uh, um, and I've never heard of him, okay? He's exposing the business, and what do you think of it? So they came over to my house. Uh, they took pictures, and this was over a period of a week, because was, this was a nationwide story that went for six, maybe even well, five, six days, I'm sure, anyway. And it was bits and pieces of this article. But they relied on me heavily. And, you know, I've got, I've got those news stories up on my website and so forth. And, you know, what I had always said is I had to protect the business. So when he said that, when Eddie Mansfield had told the report, well, no, 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 you know, we're told when to lose, how long, or when to win, and so forth, etc. cetera. And, and, and I would come back and say, well, you know, that's not so, because the winners get paid more than the losers. So you're always trying to win your match. And of course, I had to protect the business. And, you know, months or so after that story aired, you know, even Gorilla Monsoon, Arnold Skoll, said, hey, man, you did a good job protecting the business, because that's, that's what it was about, you know. We always wanted to make this business look legitimate as possible, and I certainly did. And, uh, you know, I, can, I understand his gripe. He's getting paid $35 or $50 for a match and, and having to use the blade and all that. But he was working for small companies. They were the small companies. You know, uh, like I don't even know. They're, they've been going so long. Mm. And this is why I want to go to the WWF. took my chances. And I started making great money. I mean, especially in 19, 1981, you know, when they hired me in 80 to come up to do TV. I was making great money because also I was working as the executioner and Ron Shaw. So, you know, why, you know, what do I got to complain about? If they're going to move me up the ladder, which they did as the executioner, they were going to send me at the end of the year, I didn't know this, to California to work out for Mike LaBelle, and they told me this last minute, and I had gotten some advice 
from some of the guys. You know, S.D. Jones, Bob Backlund, Kowalski, and uh, it didn't sound like a very good thing to do. Well, I decided not to go, and I figured I was going to continue working. Well, you know, Vince had let me go, and I went right to work for Kowalski for his bedlam from Boston, which was the IWF for two years. And, and I came back with Vince again. He took me back, no problem. You know, I talked to Mr. McMahon, and uh, he, he was such a great, such a great man. He said, you know, Ron, we got a, we got a lot of guys on board, but you know what? Come on back. And he took me back. What a, what a, what a great guy to do that. And, and I ended my, well, I didn't end my career until actually 1999. But my WWF reign went from 1984, five. Six and seven, and that's pretty much my end of my WWF years. So, senior you know, that, and that was a story, and I never regret it putting anybody over in this business. Senior and junior, pleasant to work for your experiences. Um, yeah, I, I have to say, I never had no problem. You know, I, you know, of course, he's a very busy man. Um, you know, the opposite of his father. His father was very low key. Uh, very, very, you know, nice to talk to. And, and if you had a problem, you know, when I, I would go to him. I, I can give you an example. One time in, uh, we were doing All-Star Wrestling there in Hamburg, Pennsylvania. I did a show in Middletown, Connecticut. It was a funny thing. I can remember the exact town. And I think the payoff was $300 that night. And they would always give you a $50 advance usually. And I did get that that night. But I never got paid the rest of that money. On that day, so I went into the office. I said, Mr. McMahon, and I always use the word Mr. McMahon. Uh, I did get paid for that night. I did get the uh, advance and so forth. And he took out $250 out of his pocket and gave it to me. I, I didn't have that type of experience with this. Not that I was asking money from him, but, you know, we, we did have talks and so forth. And he was kind of stern in his talks. But I, I have no problem with, 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 with Vince Jr. I never did. Hey, Ron. It's Mike Monty. So it's uh, okay. Question Go for ahead. you: Do you wear the executioner mask and eat a sandwich while you have it on? What? <laughs> you, you, you're asking me that question. Oh my God! Especially, especially after what I <laughs> what I said about five minutes ago. Is, is this a laughing? comedy show? Is this a comedy show, Monty? Oh boy! Let me tell you something. When I put on that mask, or I didn't put on that mask. I worked hard. Okay, I worked hard. I had my leg broken. Okay, it was pictured in that big uh, nationwide story, uh, story, uh, story that Ron Shaw, the legitimacy of his sport. I've broken fingers. I've broken knuckles. I've got a crooked shoulder to this day. And you're going to ask me a question like that? Come on, man. Wise up, will you? All right, I'll ask you, I'll ask you a serious question. When David Schultz slapped John Tossel, a uh, Stossel, sorry. What did you think was going on with the industry, and uh, what was Schultz like? Was he as crazy as it sounded? <laughs> the David. The David. The, 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 say that again. David Schultz. Yes. Remember, he slapped was he John as crazy Stossel. As you would think, or as tough. Of course, the man was tough. He was a bounty hunter. The man was a bounty hunter also, okay? But professional wrestling is really what made him his money, okay? He didn't have to go chasing down goons. He came here, and, he, you know, he, he's got a past. He's a tough guy, man. Tough guy. You know, I've talked to him a few times, but he was also a loner, too. How did you feel about the rise of Hulkamania? Did you see it coming? And were you surprised how big it got? I did not see that coming. And you know when he when when Hogan came in, I, I don't know how many how many TVs he had, he had done or or how long I was there, but uh, I had a match against him on Championship Wrestling, mm -hmm. and you know I, I when we worked in the ring, I don't remember much what we even said about the dressing room except that he what finish that he uses, which was his uh, uh, leg drop across the throat. Uh, we went into the ring, and he, to me, he just seemed like he was a little lost in there. Really? I mean, you know, he did something where he sat me up on the turnbuckle, came over, and just, you know, gave me a nice, gentle little slap on the cheek. And I came down, and, I, and if I remember correctly, I, I got some heat on him, and then we went into the finish. And when he got me back in the dressing room, 
He says, you know, Ron, I, guess, I, don't, I don't know why I tapped you on the cheek like that. And I kind of thought that was kind of a strange, strange thing to say because here's a, here's a guy who, who's had more experience than me already, even though he might have been working in Atlanta and, and Minneapolis and so forth. Uh, but, you know, to answer your question, did I see it at the time? No. I did not see it at the time. But th- did it surprise me? No, that he went on to be as big as he could because, you know, after, Bru- after Bruno, the, the, the greatest world champion ever, Hulk Hogan came, and that was that was another great world champion. And then anybody after that, I I couldn't have cared less about him. There, oh, there, you, there was you tuned out? After Hogan, WWF died as far as I was concerned. After Hogan uh, was not with the business. But he, he was a great star, great talent. He ended up being, and we know the rest of the story. Ron, is that when you stopped watching wrestling? I mean, after Hogan, like, Attitude Ever did nothing for you? Rock, Austin... Nothing. I I pretty much you know I, I may have watched it a little bit longer after that and, and of course I was you know I was still traveling through the nineties mm-hmm. okay I was doing a whole bunch of shows every month right. overseas right and I had a wrestling school uh, after we did the NWF me and my partner AJ Petruzzi we were the executioners in the NWF in nineteen eighty eight and eighty nine and and that that dissolved pretty much and uh, had a wrestling school and. Uh, and I was ready to give up the business at that time because uh, I was working some shows at the TNA, uh, and this wasn't going anywhere. And I called Kowalski up one day, and I said, hey, Walter, I said, you know, I'm thinking about quitting the business. You know, I could have called this up again, but it just didn't seem like, you know, what I wanted to do anymore with the type of flash and stories and still crazy storylines I've never even heard of before. And actually, actually, you know, when you watched it, I watched it, it got me disgusted, just I guess just like it did to Bruno. Uh, there was no place for that in wrestling. And uh, I, I just uh, called him up and I said, you know, I'm going to quit this business. He goes, wait a minute. He goes, you got a passport? I said, yeah. He goes, look, he goes, I'm going to pass your name to a promoter. So don't tell anybody that I helped you out here. Because, you know, he had his own school. He had his bookings that he had to get done to. And I wrestled uh, pretty much every month all around the world. You know, I'd go for about maybe five to eight, nine days, and, and uh, you know, wrestling was still wrestling like it was through the 90s. It just got, it just got worse, I guess, in the year 2000 or after I retired. It just got that mm. that, that, that's really when I really quit, quit watching. I mean, I probably didn't watch it, but, you know, it paid some attention to it, right? And that was, that was pretty much it. I feel like guys like Frankie Williams and yourself, certain people did certain things for a long time over there and did them very well. Any uh, thoughts on the validity of an enhancement talent getting the ultimate nod from Vince? Uh, I, I have to say, well, you know, Johnny Rods was put in the WWE Hall of Fame. Right. And, and I think rightfully, rightfully so, because he was with the company. Right. When I was a little kid going down to Philadelphia's 46th and Market to watch the, you know, watch the TV tapings, mm-hmm. he was wrestling. Mm-hmm. And here I am. Years later, wrestling him. He, he was with the company so long, and, and he helped get some guys out there. I think he was training a few guys here and there and so forth. And, uh, uh, but anyway, he was a very lucky guy. He was booked all the time, and he was deserving. The others, no. No, not deserving. I not mean, even you know, poor Frankie? Piper's Pit say, Frankie? You know, there's, a, there's a lot of guys in there that don't belong in there. Uh, people may not know this, but you wrestled in the three-man tag match when the Freebirds first came up here. Mm. I'm a big fan of the Freebirds. Uh, what was it like when those guys were coming up, and was there a problem because, you know, they were from down south? Did you have issues with them? And by the way, you, no, your partner was Butcher Pete Doherty, right? Right. That's right. Did I have a problem with them because they were down from the south? Is that what you're asking me? That's what I asked. Uh, no, why should I? You know, hey, they, 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 were a, they were a talent, exciting talent. The place went crazy for them. And, but I just don't think there was a, uh, a long-term position for them being a six-man or a three-man tag team. That was the only issue. And they, and they didn't last that long. You know, we, I worked against them again in the Philadelphia Spectrum in my hometown with uh, uh, Rene Goulet and Charlie Fulton again. And, uh, yeah, they, they brought the electricity there. Who was bigger, San Martino 
or Hogan? Now, I already know he's your personal favorite, Bruno, but was Bruno bigger than Hulk Hogan in the long run? Your thoughts? Bruno was bigger in a sense that, you know, he promoted the wrestling. He was a wrestler's wrestler, a man that came out into the ring every night without a jacket, without this, without that, had the championship belt. And that was just as much, uh, uh, you know, as a turn on to the fans as Hulk Hogan coming out and his headband tearing off his shirts and so forth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in my opinion, you know, I always opted for the wrestling. Uh, You know, I'm old school, like a lot of guys still are today. Sure. But, you know, not taking nothing away, nothing away from Hogan, but, you know, of course, yeah, my, my favorite was always Bruno San Martino. And, you know, you know, at eight years old, I loved watching him. You know, he used to buy, as a kid, I used to buy wrestling books and this and that, and everyone had to have Bruno San Martino in it, of course. And, and you know, very fortunate to, to you know, be good friends with Bruno. And, and uh, unfortunately, I never was able to wrestle Bruno. Uh, he did interview me in Allentown when he was the color man when we were doing the international wrestling tapings and, uh, uh, a couple times, as you know, I had a match where my tag team partner, who turned on me, and you know, I bled in the ring and so forth. So we had a war, pretty much me and him. And, and you know, he interviewed me. But you know, that, that's the best memory of Bruno I can have. Is is you know, it would have been wrestling him, but you know, he at least interviewed me two times during that time. And uh, that's a great that's a great memory to have in my lifetime. Dale Cole, who's been on the show, he's the brother of Tom Cole who uh, actually took his life about a year ago, uh, had issues with sexual harassment and sued the WWE. Um, there was, it was called the Ring Boy Scandal. Mel Phillips and Terry Garvin, um, did you ever hear about these Ring Boy Scandals? Did you see this stuff going on? And did you see Mel Phillips and Terry Garvin doing this type of stuff? Well, you know, here we go again. Here we go again. You're, you're, again, this is a question that you said you were going to post to me on the show, and and I didn't want to I didn't want to answer this this here. I mean, this this is a little bit of a of something that's been in the past already. I don't think your listening audience is interested in hearing about this, especially out of my lips. I don't know nothing about that because you know I minded my own business. Okay, I minded my own business. That's a fair enough answer. So let me ask you this, someone who didn't mind their own business and went on Donahue and Larry King was Mm. your hero, Bruno Sammartino, Mm. who certainly and admitted it during these shows that he knew this was going on, but he blamed Vincent Kennedy McMahon uh, for not doing anything about that. Why do you think Bruno didn't use his power to try to stop this? Well, what what power did he really have at that time, if I'm not mistaken? I, I know they were at odds with each other. I think there was supposed to be a lawsuit against Vince. And uh, they, I, th- I think maybe, I think there was a, you know, little settlement on the side that he would do color, commentary, and so forth. And, well, what could he have really done? That's a, that's a fair enough answer. I'm just asking. And I'm just answering. One thing I do remember about Rick is at the end is when we were leaving, I think it was a three-week three week tour, um, he was, he, he, he got sick at the end of a show. And I know he was going to be taken to the hospital. And we flew back without him. He, he came back later. And then I don't know how many months later he took his own life. And that was a sad thing, but, you know, unfortunately it ran in the family. Uh, Suicide. Was this a good-paying job, or did you have to have a side job? Because after I learned that Gary Michael Capetta was really a teacher most of the time, I was very distraught. Uh, Did they pay you enough back in those days? (laughs) I'm serious! Well, I I don't think Gary Michael Capetta had to get paid the type of money that we got paid for just announcing all night. Right, okay. We took all the bumps, the bruises, the broken bones, and everything like that. Sure. And no, I never did have a a, a part-time job because I would have lost my job. I worked, I I, I made this a point to have a living, make it a living. And I did, yeah, there were some down times, and there was a lot of up times. But I knew, I knew when to get out of the business. 
And Excellent. I did it for 20 years. Excellent. All right, Ron, here we go. We had David Sammartino in studio. Oh, here we go. Maybe uh, his only goes. interview. Maybe. Oh, here he goes. Doesn't what? Work. All right. I, I, go. I'm rooting Whatever. that he answers he, he clears this story. Uh, Listen, no, no, let, me, let me just ask the question. Can I ask the question? I've asked this question. 15 times I've been asked this question, and I've given the same answers. Why don't you just go back and Google my other shows that I was on? There's 14 other shows. But go ahead. Go all ahead. Right. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead, okay? First of all, you're on Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast. But so instead, here's the question I'm going to ask you. Instead of with the kayfabe and acting like he hurt his back, like, why don't you finally reveal to the fans that Sam Martino told you what was going to happen and you, and you did what you had to do because that was your role and stop keeping this story that you go for show to show to going on. Admit it on this show. Right. Okay, okay, okay. I'm going to tell you something right now. Mm -hmm. First of all, what I'm going to say about David San Martino, when he came into the WWF, he was probably the strongest, if not the strongest wrestler that I've ever seen. And especially when you combine that with a great wrestling talent and knowledge of holds and counter holds, this, made this, this guy was really a super, super star. But on a fateful night, in November 1985, after two big slugs behind the back, behind his head, six or seven body slams later, which nobody can take, he walked out of that ring holding his back, and he heard it on his show. He said, I heard his back. I was the better man that night. Now, if you want to believe what he said, you go right ahead and believe what he said. But I said all I can say about it is that, and, and, and here's another thing, you Google Anywhere, YouTube, Vimeo, or any other search engine, and watch that match and see the comments below. 99.9% .9 of the fans back Big Ron Shaw, and they know what happened. And they, some people, that one, that small percentage, they say, well, Ron Shaw stepped in the ring. He, you can see he's telling Dusty Feldbomber to finish. I remember exactly what I said to Dusty Feldbomber just to prove you're wrong and some of the other fans wrong. Is I said, hey, Dusty, it looks like a good sellout tonight. That's what I said. I wasn't telling him any finish because you know what? I had in my mind what I was going to do that night because when I heard some type of a rumor going on in that dressing room, I did what I was going to do, the right thing. Now, I hope that answers your question, Monty, Mr. Well, wise Guy. Well, let me try it another way. Let me try it this way. Hello, Ron. Oh, no. Did David Sammartino really hurt you? It's the kid across the or pond. Or not? You or did you give it up, Ron? You punk. You punk. Oh, I'm a punk. Let me tell you something. It wouldn't take me oh, no more boy. than two and a half hours to fly down there no. and slap your no. face all over that no, damn studio. Don't. You understand me? I'm done. Not I'm done. Come on, man. Pharaoh, Come thank on, Ron. you, man. You were the man. Bye, Ron. Bye, Ron. If I ever do a convention down in New York City, mm. I hope you're there. Over and out.